little, little bracing. Okay. We are live. I'm hitting record in the cloud. All right. I did it. Yay. <laughs> good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. Thank you everyone for joining us today. This is Dyslexia Coffee Talk. I'm your host, Ashley. And our guest today is the author, Don Nguyen, and his book, which is just, I'm sorry, it's about to come out in its second edition, or it's just come out in its second edition? It's already out. I, I do have the new cover here. You probably have the old cover. There you so. go. Raising a Child with Dyslexia, What Every Parent Needs to Know. I love your book. It's an incredible book. I, you know, this is definitely going on our must, you know, our must read list for all parents. Um, and so I actually don't know the first year that you came out with this book. I'm sorry. I should have actually checked that out. But um, 20, October of 2019. Okay. I, yeah, I released it at the Central Texas Dyslexia Conference. I gave the uh, keynote address at that conference. Nice. So what, what, in, what inspired you to write this book? Well, I, I always had the label of dyslexia, but I didn't understand it. Uh, now, when I say I always had it, I didn't have it till I was in the second year in the first grade. <laughs> when I started school, I love kindergarten, by the way, because back then it's probably different now. Back then we played with blocks, we played with, crayons, Play-Doh, things like that. It was more for socialization. Right. But once I started in the first grade, that's when the real work began. That's where we, we had to learn uh, how to do spell simple words, we, you know, math, all of that. And I was completely lost from the very beginning. And I struggled. I started having severe anxiety. Um, the teacher uh, knew that I wasn't grasping things and she you know, did what she could to help. Uh, my parents knew there was something wrong. I was losing weight, but no one understood dyslexia. Um, they didn't know really how to help me. So at the end of the first year, and I was at a lot, uh, I was sick a lot. A lot of that was probably due to the anxiety, but the decision was made um, after discussing me with my, my parents that we'll just keep them back for another year. Well, what's the problem in doing that? Well, if you take uh, a child that is in the wrong learning environment that doesn't work the first year and you put them in the same environment the second year, you're not going to get a better result. Exactly. And, and so I continued to struggle. And I was very fortunate because there was a, uh, a special ed teacher. Her name was Mrs. Davis. And uh, I don't remember any of my teacher's name from the entire, uh, all my elementary school years, except for the first grade teacher, because I had her for two years. Her name was Mrs. Carson and Mrs. Davis. She was taking an extension course on dyslexia because this was a new thing and uh, very few people knew anything about it. And when my first grade teacher was discussing uh, some of the problems I was having, Mrs. Davis recognized those symptoms from the, the course she was taking. It says, sounds like he has dyslexia. And so they, uh, they arranged for me to be dismissed from Mrs. Carson's class for an hour each day. And she worked on me, uh, worked with me one-on-one. -on -one. And she had me get all my favorite books. Now, all of my favorite books were my favorite because they were full of pictures. Right. Because I used the pictures to tell the story. And so I just love looking at the pictures. And what do you think she did when she opened up a book? Oh, gosh, seeing all those pictures, <laughs> she's concerned that there's no words. <laughs> uh, well, there are words in them, but mm. she covered up all the pictures. Oh, of and course, it's like, that. okay, this is no longer my favorite book. Right. <laughs> <laughs> But what she did is she took a ruler, she uh, highlighted the first line, and she took each word um, in, in, on each line. She broke them up into syllables, and she helped me to sound them out. She worked with me on phonemic awareness. She had me work with, with the phonics at home with my parents. And she, she worked with me for, uh, for a long time, probably several months. And she got me to the point where I was able to read. 
Uh, now here's the problem. Not only did I have uh, dys dyslexia uh, problem with decoding the written word, that's the primary uh, issue with dyslexia is the decoding issue. But I also had some, uh, some of the sibling conditions of dyslexia. I had dysgraphia. It was trouble getting uh, your thoughts that are in your head down on paper. Yep. And it can also involve uh, handwriting and, and holding a pen and so forth. Uh, I had dyscalculia, the trouble with sequencing, trouble with, uh, with uh, directional matters. Uh, you know, the list goes on, a lot of complications. Mm -hmm. uh, problem, a problem with uh, uh, remembering more than maybe a couple steps at a time. And now uh, you can imagine how this would add complications. I also had some dyspraxia. And so once, uh, once they got me to read, okay, he's fine now. Back in the regular classroom, I, found, I got sent on to the, the second grade, but I continued to struggle. I continued to have anxiety. I did not do well. And then by the time I was in the fifth grade, I, my, my mother had left and uh, we started, my, my dad, we moved. We, I grew up in Denver, we moved to Ohio. And that's the worst thing in the world. At least I was in a stable environment for, to a point. But once we moved, my grades went from like C's down to uh, D's and F's. And I was just an emotional a basket case. And so the problem is, yeah, the, they address the reading, but as far as the other aspects of dyslexia and the social and emotional needs of dyslexia, those were never addressed. And so I continued to struggle uh, throughout uh, my school years. And it caused a lot of complications, a lot of health issues as well. And so uh, I realized that one of the most important needs um, beyond just reading is for any dyslexic child, especially if they, they have more severe dyslexia or it's sibling conditions that they receive uh, that social and emotional support. Uh, you know, it starts at home with the parents and, the, and you know, the parents, they're, they're just as flummoxed as the child is unless, unless they uh, are able to understand it, dyslexia, what, uh, what it causes and also how to, to help their child. And then, and then working with the school and how to, to make sure the child gets accommodation, uh, gets the right kind of instructions and continues to get the social and emotional support. And so for that reason, uh, um, I wrote the book, Raising a Child with Dyslexia, which focuses primarily on the social and emotional aspects, although it does touch on, on reading and other things. Um, and the social emotional aspect is, I think, something that gets left behind way too often, especially in the school environment. I think parents try their best to focus on that, but it's, it seems to be a, a, a cost when you're trying to do remediation on top of, if you're doing private remediation, especially on top of, you know, the demands of the school day, especially. I remember my parents would always fuss at me um, because we started private remediation when he was barely seven years old, when he hit the dyslexia wall. And um, he was doing four hours a day, five days a week at the very beginning. And then he switched to one hour sessions three times a week in the fall. And my parents were always like, you're not letting him be a little kid. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> we're doing our best. We moved, <laughs> he's on a soccer team. <laughs> but at the same, you know, when you're deep in the neck of trying to, provide some remediation. I think that that's, that's a difficult thing to balance. Do you have some advice or guidance on kind of how to try to balance those things? And what is that really a challenging time? Yeah. Um, well, probably the, the, the very first place any parent needs to begin with is learning all they can about dyslexia and its, its, and its sibling conditions. And then and then making an evaluation on, okay, what are the, the complications my own child is dealing with? Mm -hmm. Because not every dyslexic child is alike. Okay. Um, I remember uh, talking with, uh, when I was uh, uh, 
still working in the secular field. A couple of co-workers, and I, I mentioned that I'm dyslexic. Oh yeah, I, I'm, I'm dyslexic. I used to be dyslexic, but I'm doing just fine now. <laughs> they didn't really understand that. And some of them may have just had a mild problem with reading, but never right. none of the other sibling conditions. So with just a little bit of help, uh, they're able to do just fine in school. But not, not every child is like that. And some, child, uh, some children need a, a lot more of the social and emotional support. And in order for a, a parent to be able to provide that, they have to understand exactly what their child is dealing with. Uh, mm -hmm. Do they have dyscalculia? Do they have dysgraphia, dyspraxia, dysphonia, any of those other sibling conditions? What, what do those entail? What sort of complications do they have? Um, and then once you understand that, and then, uh, then you can begin to say, okay, what sort of needs does emotional, social needs does my child have? And having that conversation with your child on a daily basis is very important for parents too. By the way, all of that's covered in detail in my book, as you know. Yes. Uh, so, because there, there's no way to, to cover all of that in a brief conversation, but to really be able to understand what all those uh, sibling conditions are and so forth. But once a, a parent understands that, then to be able to, to know what's on your child's mind, now, even at a very young age. Uh, one of the, the biggest problems that I had when I was uh, even first starting to struggle in school is I did not want to raise my hand or say I didn't understand or, hey, this is confusing to me because I felt embarrassed. Uh, I, I looked around. I didn't see any other kid raising their hand. And so I just kind of sat there in silence. And what does, that, what does that do? It just causes more anxiety. And then you can become further behind and then you get more anxiety. And then it, it infiltrates all other aspects of your life. And so a parent needs to be very observant with their child. You know, are they, are they uh, like if they're starting school, uh, are they starting to act a little differently? Are they showing any signs of anxiety? Uh, mm -hmm. Are they, are they uh, beginning to uh, maybe spend excessive time with video games and, and other outlets that before they didn't as an escape? All of those can be signs that there's something going on with the child. And then it's always good to have those daily conversations with them. Uh, now, if, if as a parent, you're, you're uh, dyslexic, uh, whether you knew it at the time you were a child or not, that's a good conversation to have with your child as well. Did you know when I was your age that I really struggled when I was in school? I, I, I didn't want to raise my hand and uh, ask for help. I, I couldn't talk to my parents. Uh, uh, are you having any uh, uh, feelings like that? Um, and, then, and just listen and see what, what comes out. And sometimes mm -hmm. you may need to talk to the teacher uh, to say, uh, have you noticed any, anything different uh, with my child and uh, maybe how they're behaving? Are they acting out? Are they more withdrawn? See, all of these can be, uh, can be signs that they may be dealing with, uh, with uh, dyslexia or one of its sibling conditions. Um, another thing I talk about a lot in the book is that in a lot of cases, dyslexia can be diagnosed even before a child enters school. Um, for instance, uh, my, my son is, is also dyslexic, but he didn't have dyscalculia like I did. He was very good at math. Uh, so, you know, he kind of put me to shame when that went as far as that goes. But um, when he was about four years old, he was using words like uh, dinta dinta for air conditioner or effluent for, uh, for elephant or, or uh, took it for, for carrot and so forth. And so if, if you notice your child is mispronouncing a lot of words, especially the multisyllabic words, then that could be an indication that, uh, uh, of dyslexia and it'd be worth having them evaluated. Now, in some cases, uh, they could even be diagnosed as early as 18 months. And of course, you'd have to have a professional to be able, that knows what they're doing to be able to do that. Uh, has, has trouble with uh, creative, uh, creating rhyming sounds. Uh, mm -hmm. That's another one. Uh, shows a poor phonemic awareness. Uh, shows confusion with directionality. Now, again, this is part of, of dyscalculia, you know, uh, left, right, up, down, 
uh, has trouble with analog clocks. I couldn't understand, you know, tell time on analog clock. I couldn't tie my shoes. I could not learn to tie my shoes. This was a, a directional thing. Uh, so if you notice things like that, a lot of times parents don't even pay any attention. Oh, well, he's only four. Uh, he'll, he'll, he'll learn, but that could be a symptom of, of, uh, of dyslexia or one of its sibling conditions, mm -hmm. uh, poor sequencing ability. Uh, having trouble following instructions if you tell them more than one, more than one or two steps at a time. Right. Uh, a lot of parents say, well, he's just not paying attention. Well, I get, you know, if you tell me more than one or two steps, I just forget everything after that, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, because I'm trying to hold on to that first step because I don't want to miss it. Right. Um, if, if there's a family history of, of, uh, of dyslexia, um, often parents... And this was it's so fascinating because often parents and even grandparents begin to recognize their own undiagnosed dyslexia when they see their child or, or grandchild struggling with it uh, because dyslexia is highly heritable. So if there's a family history on either side of the family, then there's a greater uh, chance that the, the child could also have dyslexia. And so all of this is dis uh, discussed in the book, but it's important to be able to, to really take a good look at all of these as, as a whole. And if you see anything that may be uh, a possibility of dyslexia, check with a, a professional mm -hmm. uh, to see if you can, can get them diagnosed. Now, the earlier you can get them diagnosed, even before they start school, the better, because then you can begin working with the, the social and emotional support. You can begin working with the school to make sure that their, their proper teaching methods are employed, that they have the right reading instructions, that they have the accommodation. Um, and then each day you can give, give the child the, the cheerleading that they need <laughs> in order to, to have a very uh, healthy, um, po positive self-image -im mm -hmm. as well as, as self-esteem that, that comes along with that. Well, and I love that you called out the words, um, you know, I, I, my son would say, remember, and ridiculous. <laughs> um, drove my husband nuts that he said, remember. Um, and finally, one day our son turned around. On, I mean, he, I think he was nine or 10 at this point. He turned around to my husband and he said, I hear it right in my head. And you're telling me I, I'm saying it wrong. Um, and that was around the time I um, drug my husband to listen to both of the Shaywitzes give, give a lecture. And when she talked about how uh, Dr. Sally Shaywitz specifically talked about how dyslexia is a language processing disorder. And she then specifically called out that they hit, you know, in their head, the word is correct, but what comes out of their mouth, the word is mispronounced. That that's one of the key signs. And I was like, you know, kicked my husband's chair and he turned around and looked at me and went, I'm sorry, I'll never do it again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, and the, and the generational thing too, you know, and for, I, I, unfortunately, or unfortunately, fortunately or unfortunately, I'm not, I'm not quite sure, you know, the, we've known about dyslexia for, for what is it like 144 years now? In a while. And people are still kind of talking about dyslexia like it's it's this new thing. And our, you know, the older generations don't necessarily, they probably didn't get a diagnosis, may not, may not know. I remember when my son was diagnosed, you know, my husband, not my husband, my father called me and said, um, is dyslexia one of these newfangled diseases like gluten intolerance? And I was like, um, no, sir. <laughs> you know it's an interesting let, comment yeah <laughs> let me um let me educate you and you know and as I shared with you before we went live you know it was two years ago that my now almost 80 year old mother looked at me and you know and she was kind of afraid to say it and she shared her own lifelong struggles with reading and she's an avid reader now but she shared her struggles with reading and how hard it was for her to get through school and how hard she had to work. And she had to read the text numerous times because the first time was just trying to get through the text and nothing made sense. And the second time was attempting 
to try to make sense out of just shapes on a page that didn't mean anything to her. And then, you know, over and over again until she understood it to be able to do her work. You know, and almost falling out of my chair going, mom, <laughs> I, I think you might be dyslexic. <laughs> um, but that's, I think that that's, you're right. And that's a profound part of, of the journey. Um, but I do want to talk more about anxiety because I feel like anxiety is one of those very misunderstood things. Um, I think people think of anxiety as a, as a, you know, greater response to something, but sometimes it can be inward too, where the child's more withdrawing inward and you're getting maybe one word answers to things and they seem to just be carrying the world on their shoulders. And um, I think that within the challenge of dyslexia, because the child's struggling so much with reading, of course, the, the weight on their shoulders is misunderstood as frustration instead of necessarily anxiety. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, please. I, that, I was leading yeah. into a question, so please. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, anxiety was something that uh, I, I've suffered from at the very start. And even, even through all of my early years and even into my adult life. And here's, here's why I think it's important for a child and even an adult to understand and own dyslexia. Because what happens is when you realize that you're different, that you don't fit in, that you're not understanding like others, you're not getting it, you don't wanna ask for help, everything is, is internalized. And, and, as, and, and as, as it continues to go on, it just, it just becomes ingrained. And the anxiety can become so pronounced, it can cause a lot of physical, uh, ailments beyond just anxiety as it did in my case when I when I was young and so uh, by removing that that barrier uh, taking it from internal and uh, out in the open and help the child to see you know you're not broken uh, you're not dumb you're 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 very intelligent you can do whatever you'd like to do you just have a different way of learning things and that's okay and by helping the child to see that the reason they're struggling is not because they're, uh, they're deficient in some way, they just have a different way of processing information. And as a parent, you're gonna help them uh, figure out what works best for them. And you're gonna work with them and you're gonna work with the school, work with the teachers, whatever it takes to make sure that they get what they need and help them to be able to open up uh, when they start feeling anxious to be able to talk with you about it and, and, and listen, just have a listening ear. Um, you know, one, one uh, uh, mistake a lot of parents make is they wanna jump in there right away and correct them uh, before they even have a chance to unburden themselves with whatever is going on. And sometimes, uh, and a lot of times, there may not be anything to correct them about. You just need to understand what's going on with them. Right. and. And, and then to take time to think about it and then to come up with some workable uh, things that you can do to help the child uh, to not feel that way or to re redirect those, uh, those feelings. Um, and so that's why it's important to uh, not only to understand dyslexia and how it, affects, how it affects you, but also to accept it and say, you know, it's okay. Uh, and then to realize there are a lot of very famous dyslexics in the world and even throughout history that have accomplished great things, you know, like Einstein. <laughs> and here's something that was very telling. I had a, uh, I was on a, I gave a, uh, a uh, presentation to a group of parents out of the Dallas-Fort Worth area that of all, all dyslexic children, it was for a dyslexic class. And um, um, I talked to them a little about it. And then the following morning, I talked to the group of dyslexic children. And so I asked them a bunch of questions. The first question is, as I said, now, um, how many famous dyslexics do you know? And everybody's hand went up. 
And they said anything from Einstein to you know, Thomas Edison and so forth. And then I followed up with another question. Now, how many feel as though if you have dyslexia that you're less intelligent than other people? Did you know that there was a few hands that raised? There was a disconnect between, okay, Einstein was not a dummy and he was dyslexic, but, oh, I think all dyslexics are less intelligent. Even though they had a dyslexia teacher and the parents had uh, some understanding of dyslexia, there was still a lack of that social and emotional support that they needed. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of the children, not all of them, but some of the children were still struggling with their own self-worth worth, and anxiety that, that, uh, that came from the struggles that they were having. Um, and of course, uh, most all of them uh, mentioned that reading was their number one difficulty. But some of them also mentioned math and sequencing and other things. So I saw some, some of those sibling conditions in there. So yeah, anxiety is a biggie and it needs to be addressed as early as early on as possible. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm, you know, we've been talking at least here at DI more and more and more about anxiety because I think that it's just sort of one of those things with dyslexia that we as a community just aren't talking enough about. And we definitely need to be talking more about it because anxiety, you know, left left to flounder as you as you said, can just create more and more problems. Anxiety can end up becoming the greater problem. Yeah, yeah. yeah. you develop those, those neural pathways uh, in response to stress. Right. In response to, I can't, I'm not understanding this at school. Uh, I don't want to, I'm afraid to raise my hand. I'm going to get teased. Whatever the case may be, then um, you have an anxiety response. And then anytime any sort of stressful circumstances, circumstance happens, then that same neural pathway is triggered and it goes right to anxiety and it's reinforced. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the longer that <clears throat> goes on, the harder it is to undo that. And so it's, it's really important that a parent early on recognize th those uh, symptoms and then help the child to develop more healthy pathways. Completely. Um, you talk about within your book, self-compassion, perseverance, and passion. So let's, let's shift to that. What is... Let's talk about like in your book, how, how are you recommending to parents to foster self-compassion? Because that's a big deal too. Yeah. Well, I think the first thing that's important is for a parent to model that for the child by also showing uh, compassion uh, to the child and, their, and the struggles and also show that uh, how that they care for themselves and being open and, and vulnerable with the child as far as you know, I have things that uh, really bother me or cause me a lot of stress that I struggle with and I have when I was younger. And this is how what helped me and how I kind of soothed myself. And it's okay to do that. And it's okay to talk about it and to really be open with the child in that way. And then to, and the, to model that for the child and help the child to, to realize that, you know, it's okay to be kind to yourself. Uh, when you feel like you're not getting it, when you start beating up on yourself and thinking of yourself as being stupid, uh, uh, hopeless, and that's when shame comes into the picture. You know, uh, when shame comes into the picture, shame is, uh, I can't do any better. You know, uh, th this, is, this is who I am, not, okay, I have a problem, but I can do better. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, it's a, very, uh, a very negative emotion that can cause a lot of a lot of damage and so we want to, a parent wants to remove that from the child and help the child to see themselves in a positive way and and whenever whenever they're dealing with a struggle uh, have some positive ways to be able to, to soothe themselves and show them show, show themselves kindness and not call it, feel like they're stupid and, and so forth um, and here's where uh, you mentioned uh, uh, tenacity and grit uh, you know, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of um, uh, dyslexia groups that talk about dyslexia being a superpower. Now, I'm, I'm speaking for myself here. 
uh, dyslexia does have its strengths, you know, when, when we recognize what they are and every dyslexia is different. But I don't consider dyslexia itself as being a superpower. It, it's, it's caused me a lot of problems right. growing up. But some of the things that can, uh, that you can develop because of dyslexia can be a superpower, like grit, tenacity, determination. Mm -hmm. See, you know, all, all humans want to avoid or minimize hard, frustrating, or painful tasks or events. But when grit and, uh, grit and tenacity, it allows a person to make a different choice. And that is to stick with something, even though it's difficult. And the reason is, is because you know the results matter. And by nurturing those traits in a dyslexic child and modeling those for your child, um, you know, by, by showing that, you know, I, I really struggled with this, but I stuck with it and look what I was able to accomplish. You can do the same thing. Uh, you're capable of doing whatever you'd like to do. You may have to find a different pathway to get to there, but you can accomplish that and really help them to develop that grit and determination. And that, that can be the, a superpower because grit and tenacity, uh, it, can, it can allow a child, regardless of what the difficulty may be, to be able to surmount that and to be able to accomplish whatever they want. Yeah. And I, I, I love how you, how you frame that. And when you started talking about shame, you definitely hit on a lot of my passions as well. I mean, you know, I, I think a lot of us are, you know, kind of big Brene Brown fans at this point in, <laughs> in time, especially, um, you know, the first time I heard her talk about shame, you know, and whether you're dyslexic or not, to a certain extent, everybody carries around a certain amount of shame, right? Mm -hmm. But what the thing that I think resonates the most is if you keep shame in the dark, it will always live. And you have to talk about the shame and to break that shame open and to heal from the thing that is creating shame for you and you know rightly or wrongly you know we we're not helping our dyslexic children in a lot of cases well enough and we're fostering that shame instead of shattering that shame mm -hmm. yes yeah shame shame is basically where a child says i'm bad and therefore i can't do any better it's different than than guilt where it says okay i did something bad but you know something i don't have to do it again and so shame, as you mentioned, is very damaging. And I, get, I think we're all uh, Renee Brown fans here. <laughs> <laughs> so I appreciate that. Well, and, you know, just sidebar, in case any of her team ever watches, I did ask for her to come <laughs> on here. Y'all turned me down so far. <laughs> um, but one of, one of your chapters is specifically about developing a strong work ethic and having the patience to develop that work ethic. And I think sometimes when the child is young, that's a difficult thing to sort of work through. But you do talk about that in your book. Um, can you share some of that with us here? Yeah, I, I think the hardest thing uh, for a child that struggles with anything is to not, because you want to give up. You say, this is just too hard. I just can't do it. Okay. And by helping the child understand that uh, even little successes is a success and you can build on that. And, to, to, and also ask your, your child uh, and to understand what it, is, what it is they don't really enjoy or like to do and really build on that too. You know, maybe that maybe there's something that they really love, even if it's not easy for them. Uh, that's great. Help them to, to to build on that and to foster that. Um, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, uh, kids when they grow up, they they go into a field that uh, into something that they really enjoy doing. Uh, not all of us, <laughs> at least early on. Sometimes we have to take a job that uh, that's just available to us. But a lot of time, if we have an option, especially if we go to school to learn a particular trade or so forth, we'll pick something that we really enjoy doing. And so by by helping the child um, 
have these build on these successes and see these successes and, and see that they are successes and help them to, to, to see that, you know, it, when you put in forth the effort and then you, you praise their effort and you get, you accomplish something, even if it doesn't seem like a lot, hey, that is, that is a big thing. And, uh, and then help them to, to feel good about what they're doing. And what, you know, a lot of parents are, are focused on grades instead of on, on the effort. Right. And, and that kind of uh, puts a damper on that, that, that work ethic. Because if you focus on a grade, uh, when they put in a lot of effort, maybe they only get a C and you're wanting them to get Bs and As, and then you kind of uh, beat them up for it. Well, they're just not going to want to put forth the effort anymore because the effort's not worth it. Right. But if you help them to see that the effort that they're putting forth is worth it and praise them for that effort, you know how, how hard it is to be able to, to do what you've, you've done up to this point and accomplish that, even if it's only a C. That's, that's a big thing. Mm -hmm. And help them to feel good about those little victories and to build right. on, and then they'll want more victories. Okay, well, I, I'm going to keep going because they're being praised for that effort. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's the number one thing a parent can do to help them uh, not only uh, with the build that work ethic, but to help them to have that grit and tenacity because they see that it's worth the effort. Not that, well, I just, okay, it's just no, no point trying because you know I'm gonna get beaten up for it or uh, I'm gonna be told that I'm not trying hard enough or I'm just stupid. Yeah. All, all that's very damaging. And I couldn't agree more, you know, when one of the things I've always, well, not always, since we learned about dyslexia, that I've told my son since that day <laughs> was, I don't care what your grade is. I simply care that you tried your hardest. And if your hardest was a 60, that's fantastic. I'm, I'm always going to be okay with that. Um, you know, and another thing that I've tried to do with him is like, I developed, I developed a mantra and I actually created a meme out of this mantra, but um, I did it, I did it over an entire school year and he kind of doesn't like me saying it to him anymore, but I'll remind him every now and then, but, you know, driving up to the school to drop him off in the morning, I would say to him, these people and this place don't get to define you only you get to define you. And a test is a moment in time. And maybe you didn't feel well, maybe you had a headache, maybe you were tired. It's not a reflection of how smart you are or are not. It's simply a reflection of a moment in time that's potentially impacted by tons of different factors about what's going on in your life that day. It's not a measure of who you are or your worth or your value to anybody else. And he was like, you know, I, I, he would chant it with me after a while. And, you know, of course, like I said, after about a year, he was like, mom, I know I got it. Okay. These people don't define me. <laughs> <laughs> and you got the message across. <laughs> I did. I did. Well, you know, and I was, I was trying to, but I even included myself in that, you know, I was like, I don't get to define you. I'm simply trying to run ahead of you and clear the landmines and try to help you grow and do what I think a good man is, but I don't get to define you either. And neither does your dad, neither does anybody. You are the only person who gets to define you. So I'm, I'm hoping that that sort of, you know, He's still a child. He's going to have to be reminded of that at many different points in his life. But I'm, I'm, I was trying to lay the groundwork early so that maybe at some point that rings in his head and he goes, well, wait a minute. Yeah, uh, I've been asked uh, at times, you know, during interviews, uh, one question is, you know, if you could go back and tell your younger self one thing, what would that be? And I had you know, I've answered different in different ways. But then I began thinking about what something that happened with with my dad and I. Uh, this was part of dyscalculia, which wasn't understood back then. 
uh, we were we were beginning to learn fractions in school and I just didn't get it. And so I went home and I, I just, you know, I had this homework and I was trying to, I was, I was having anxiety over it. And so my dad, uh, he was trying to explain, explain fractions to me. Well, let's see, if you take a pie and you, you cut it, it's, it's very simple. You know, I understand it now. I, I still just didn't get it. Mm-hmm. And it just got to the point where he just kind of gave up. And so I was thinking how great it would be if my dad understood dyscalculia and understood the struggle that, that I was having. And he could tell me, well, the reason why that you're having a struggle in understanding uh, is because of dyscalculia. It's just your, because your brain is wired a little differently. Now, that doesn't mean you can't understand it because you can and you can, you can accomplish a lot of great things. Um, but we just have to figure out a different way to help you to understand it. So it's okay. Don't, don't be worried about it. Don't be stressed about it. We're going to get through this with you. And I was thinking to myself uh, how I would have loved to have someone have conversations like that with me when I was younger. When I'm struggling with something to say, you know, it's okay. Here's the reason why. We'll figure this out together and you're, you're going to be able to get it. But if you don't get it right this instant, that's fine. Let's take a break from it. We'll figure out another way to understand it until you do. And, and to get, kind of re- help remove that anxiety from the equation. Mm-hmm. And so I think that that is, that is uh, such a valuable thing that parents can do with any sort of problem or challenge or difficulty that their child is experiencing in any sort of schoolwork. And I love that too, because I know one of the biggest questions that comes up within the community itself is when, you know, when that initial diagnosis happens, the parents, and I I did this too, the parents have a lot of anxiety over, should I or shouldn't I tell my child? And if I should tell them, how how do I tell them? Um, I know for myself personally, I was... I didn't necessarily ask, should I tell him, but how am I going to explain this to him? And I had an enormous amount of anxiety over it. And I waited until the morning of the first day of the new school year because we had gotten the diagnosis over the summer. I had waited until the first day of the new school year. And I sat him in my lap about 20 minutes before we left the house. And I said, you know how, how you learn how to read or how sorry, you know how reading has always been such a struggle for you? And he said, yes. And I said, well, it has a name. You know, we just sat there and we just talked about it. He, you know, in his little seven-year-old self, he was trying to get out, mom, why are you making such a big deal out of this? How you're explaining it makes sense to me. You know, how he, and this is how he would paraphrase it to me in his teenage way now of looking at me going, mom, you made way too big of a deal out of that. You just needed to explain it. Yeah. I just learned differently. And I was, and he was cool with that. <laughs> that's, that's basically it. It's not as though, okay, this is a serious problem. Right. Uh, you know, and, and you don't want to give them anything else to worry about. Right. You just want to help them. It's, it's like having a rock in your shoe and wondering why you're in pain and, and hobble when you try to run. Mm-hmm. <laughs> You know, when you realize, oh, okay, the reason is I have a rock in my shoe. Okay, then I'm not, I'm not broken. I just have to take, you know, deal with that rock. Right. It's, a, it's the same way with, with dyslexia. They just need to understand you just have a different way of learning. And mm-hmm. you're not alone. A lot of other people, in, in, including uh, famous people in all different fields, have the same uh, different way of learning. Absolutely. And so, yeah, remove, remove that, that shame from it. Uh, help them to understand what it is and say, okay, move, we'll move on from here. Definitely. And I know for him, he, he found it to be very liberating, that it, that it had a name too, that it wasn't just some mysterious illness that was just him, that it, it, it had a name. And as soon as I said, it's called dyslexia, it was like, you know, he was like, oh, right, cool. It's got a word. Woohoo. <laughs> Yeah. it's amazing what a simple little thing like having a name that mm-hmm. okay it's something that's explainable and i'm not the only one that deals with it yeah definitely oh, that's 
that lives a uh, lifts a big cloud just right do, just doing that the only the only thing that i sort of ran into was and this was this was after covid began which now i'm trying to realize we're almost two years into that but i'm going to say a year ago roughly you know he had because of my advocacy work and everything that i do and i always try to be very cautious about what i discuss around him i'm very open and honest with him about what I'm advocating for, for him with his school and his accommodations and his services. And, you know, he's fully aware of what's going on there. But the greater conversation about, you know, legislative challenges or um, the sometimes the resistance between embracing what dyslexia is you know, the, the fight that we are all engaged in and, you know, challenging curriculums that are in schools. He overheard me actually refer to dyslexia as a learning disability. And I don't like to call it a learning disability personally because you're not disabled. He's not disabled. It's just that the brain is wired differently, but we class it as a disability in order for the legal protections that our children need within the school system. But he had heard me say, disability. And it took him about two days and he, I'll never forget him walking into my office and, you know, we're all working from home and I work full time. And I was, you know, engaged in what I do day in and day out for, for living. And he walks in and tears are streaming down his cheeks. And he just goes, am I disabled? Am I broken? And I was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I, and I shoved away from my computer and I closed my eyes and I, and I, and I, and I counted to myself, just not from anger or anything like that, but just, I counted more than anything to just try to help me focus on something to collect my thoughts. And we just sat and we talked about that for a long time, that it was, you know, he's not disabled, but legally for the school system, yes, because it's the only way that I can get him accommodations and services. And he didn't, he was good with the fact that he knows that he's not disabled, but he resents the fact in some ways that he has to be classified as disabled in order to get what he needs within the school system. Um, do you run into that at all? Oh, oh absolutely. Um... And I, I, oh, I like to refer to it as a learning difference as well. And I, that's what I generally refer other than a disability. Um, even though it is classified as that in order to be able to get accommodation. And so we kind of have to have to live with that at this point. But it is, it is a, diff a different way that the, uh, the brain learns. And uh, there is a, a large segment of the population that uh, doesn't does not learn well in uh, in the current uh, academic environment, and uh, and yet uh, most institutions they don't recognize that they just have one way of teaching, and uh, you know I think that's very unfortunate. And you know you had mentioned that what well, was a, over 140 years ago when dyslexia was first observed. I think they call it. Uh, word blindness was the, yep. the, the initial diagnosis. And uh, after all of these years, there's still so much ignorance about it. And, and way too many uh, learning institutions are not really recognizing that we have multiple pathways of learning. And we all have our, our, a pathway that does better with us. Uh -huh. And um, I think the more that you can engage all of these other pathways, even for non-dyslexics, they, they learn a whole lot better uh -huh. uh, and it's a much better environment. And so I'm really, I'm really hoping that more and more schools will begin to recognize that and to begin to make that, uh, that change in how they teach, have, have more of a multi-sensory approach to uh -huh. instruction. Well, and, you know, given all of the work that Anna Gillingham did and, you know, all of all of the research and books that even came out in the very early to mid 60s, you know, it's 
how many decades have to pass? <laughs> um, we're, we're running um, almost up on the hour and I don't wanna take um, your entire afternoon from you, but you do have a chapter in your book that I wanna focus on as well because this is a huge part of our community as well. But let's talk about when your child's also gifted because I think that that's, that's so difficult, I find, to get recognized, you know, and, and I've heard people dismiss our kids of, well, every dyslexic parent wants to think that their child is gifted too. And no, not every dyslexic child is gifted, but dyslexic children can be gifted as well. And I find that to be an exceptional challenge of getting people to recognize giftedness when dyslexia exists. Yeah, and uh, I'm glad you brought that up because um, there are a lot of dyslexics that are also gifted or, or 2E. And um, they, they end up compensating for the, their dyslexia by using their strengths. And a lot of times, their struggle is gone, has gone unnoticed because, mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're intelligent uh, enough in other areas that they're able to kind of mask that. And the longer, uh, uh, or the, the longer that goes unchecked, um, the harder it is to actually get a good diagnosis. You know, a case in point, my, uh, my son is also dyslexic. Um, he was never officially diagnosed when he was a child but he had all the same uh, same symptoms uh, as far as, uh, like I mentioned, they have some of the early symptoms, phonemic awareness and so forth. Um, but he was also uh, uh, 2E. He was very, very gifted. And, um, um, you know, he's, his, his IQ is probably in the 150s. Wow. And so he, he compensated. Uh, he had a, a close to eidetic memory as well. And so he was able to compensate uh, for his difficulties. And then as an adult, when he actually went to get tested because he knew he had dyslexia, because uh, he said he can read through a, a, a page and not uh, you know, coherently, but not understand the word that he read because <laughs> it just didn't register. Uh, but when he went to be diagnosed, he said, oh, well, you're, you're not uh, dyslexic. Well, it's a lot harder to diagnose even if you are dyslexic, when you've compensated over the years, right. it's better to get it diagnosed very early on before you, you mask that. And so, um, yeah, just because uh, a child is able to compensate and it seems to be doing well, doesn't mean that they don't have dyslexia and can't use a help. Mm -hmm. And the inverse of that too, is just because a child is dyslexic, does not mean that maybe they're not gifted in math? And they're doing it all in their head and they need to be challenged at, you know, above and beyond greater measures mm -hmm. instead of doubting, well, they're, they can't read. So of course they can't do math either. The yeah. two don't necessarily go hand in hand. And I think that Very that's true. one of the misconceptions. I know a, one of my really good friends has been struggling with that because her dyslexic son is gifted in math and he can do everything inside of his head. And it's been a challenge to make the school that he goes to, which is a really great school, and it's actually a dyslexia-centric school, understand his gifted level within math itself. So, um, so I'm trying again. I'm trying to be cognizant of time because I promised you an hour. But, um, is there anything that we've not focused on within your book that you would like to highlight before we wrap up? Um, well, well, a couple of things that I, I do talk about in the book is uh, how valuable it is, especially for, for very young children and even as they're going through school to have reading time. And that can include audio books, but the love of story is one of the, the greatest things, greatest gifts that you can give to their, your child. Um, you know, if you're able um, early on, the building a preliteracy foundation, if, if uh, um, you just have a, a newborn baby or they're still a toddler, uh, 
that's not too early to start reading time with them. To have them sit in their lap and, and show them how, um, how reading works by, by just reading out loud and then pointing to the letters on the page. And then and they, they learn very early on that uh, right, uh, reading goes from left to right and that each of those little squiggly lines on a page represents a sound. And even, even whether they're dyslexic or not, uh, by doing that early on, one, they develop a love of story um, and a, a love of reading, even if they can't read yet because they love what the, what the stories that's in it. They also learn how, how writing and reading works to, to a point. And so once, the, once they start school, they're already a, a ahead in that sense and then continue to have reading time, you know, on a daily basis. And uh, I always suggest for parents that have trouble reading themselves or if they were dyslexic, you, use a notebook book. You can even sit down with a paper book and, and follow along with it. Uh, you know, I, I love audio books and uh, sometimes I try to uh, follow along. <laughs> and I don't always do as well with the follow along part, but I do love the stories. And uh, I remember, uh, probably getting a little off the beaten path here. But just the other day, I was thinking back, and I think this was in the second grade, my, uh, the teacher used to have reading time with us. And she would take about 30 minutes and she would pull out a book and she would read a section. And I, I, I remember the book she read, it was called The 21 Balloons. And it was a, I think it was 1949 Newbery book winner. Oh. And Today, it's, it's kind of a wordy book uh, as an adult looking through it. But at that time when she was reading it, I was just so engaged and enthralled. And I ha I, she had my, my focus the entire time. And then when she said, OK, reading time's over with, I didn't want her to stop. And uh, for, for a number of years, I had forgotten what that book was. And uh, so the other day, I said, you know, I was thinking about that because it had such a, a fond memory. And I, I looked it up and I was able to find out it was called The 21 Balloons. And I went ahead and got the book and the audio on it. And I, I went through the entire book. Uh, I, I enjoyed it the second time just because it brought back memories of, my, of that love of story when I was younger. And so you don't want to underestimate the power stories have uh, for children and, and how important having reading time. Mm -hmm. uh, with that child and it'll it'll encourage them to then want to be able to put forth the effort to learn to read mm -hmm. uh, when, when you have that uh, and also uh, selecting stories that have a hero of self-reference hero of self-reference is where there's a, a storybook character that deals with the same challenges or similar challenges that you do and so you can see yourself in that storybook character and when you see that storybook character able to be successful or to work through whatever that challenge is, then you realize, hey, I can do the same thing. And a hero of self-reference and stories can be very powerful for, for a young child. So by selecting the right books and having uh, developing that love of story, it can have a very positive effect, not just when they're younger, but throughout their entire life. I, I love that. Um, we're a huge fan of audiobooks. I know in my household, um, my favorite time was during summer break when, you know, because I worked full time, he would have to go to a day camp. And there was two or three years that I put him in a camp that was right next to my office. And so, you know, we could get through a book and a half a week just on the commute. <laughs> So we did the entire Percy Jackson series over a summer. Um, there, uh, the Kane Chronicles, which is another series by Rick Ryer Riordan over a summer break, um, all of Harry Potter. And of course, because the movie just came out, we just started Dune. Mm -hmm. And there are certain books that that's, those, those are our books. He doesn't run off and listen to them without me because you know he knows the password to my audible account and he <laughs> downloads books freely <laughs> um and he just did this whole series called like the the scythe series which he loved and now i'm listening to because he loved it so much and he keeps talking to me about these books um 
but we're listening to to Dune. And because he's a soccer player, um, I'm all windblown from an 8 a.m. soccer game today. But, <laughs> um, you know, 30 minutes to practice, 30 minutes home, an hour to the game, an hour back. You know, we've got time in the car every week where we just do nothing but he and I together. We listen to books. So that's that's always been something that he's always been very much in love with. And we actually started listening to audiobooks before I knew that he was dyslexic so that we had something to do in the car. And then because of his dyslexia, it just kind of got amped up and became more, more of a thing. He, he doesn't like, the interesting thing is he doesn't like learning ally, um, which I'm a huge supporter of learning allies, so don't take it that way, but he has mild uh, sensory processing issues mm. and is incredibly sound sensitive as a result. And um, the whisper sync technology with Audible is a little bit easier on his ears. So he does everything. Unfortunately, it's extremely expensive. He does everything through Audible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And all, all of my Sir K books are on Audible too. So, and that, that features a hero self-reference, one of the characters named Reggie in it. So if you, if, you, if you love that, uh, you can find them on Audible. And, and also Raising a Child with Dyslexia, there's an Audible version of it because I know there's a lot of dyslexic parents that say, well, oh, they're like having to read through that. You can also listen to it. <laughs> well, that's good too, because, you know, one of the complaints in the, in the community is not enough of the books are available to, to listen to. Um, I uh, like language at the speed of sight isn't Proust and the squid is your book is overcoming dyslexia is, but the point is that more of the books need to be available on audio audible, which of course is its own huge expense, but that's definitely something that parents are looking for. And considering that a lot of the parents may be dyslexic themselves, it just, it's going to empower them that much more if they can access it on audible. Um, any final thoughts you maybe want to leave the audience with? Yeah, if uh, I also have a lot of dyslexia resources on my website, uh, don, D-O-N-W-I-N-N dot com. It's also my blog website. And there's a, uh, there's a dyslexia articles page. You can see all of my articles and blogs on dyslexia. They're kind of listed there. Uh, you can find out all my books. Uh, that are on there. Um, and so there are a lot of resources that, that uh, can be helpful on that. Thank you. And I did actually want to bring up your blog because you you do write fairly frequently. I mean, publish fairly frequently. And you've been so generous as to share them on our page. So thank you for doing that. <laughs> <laughs> but your blog is a huge resource to parents. So thank you for bringing that up too. And for everybody that's listening, I've listed Don's book in the comments as well as his website. So if you look in the comments, you can find both of those references there. Thank you so much for joining us. The comments have been amazing. Um, people are blown away really by everything that you've shared today. <clears throat> Sorry. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you for joining and, us. And thank your audience for, for joining in too. Yes, thank you all for joining. <laughs> Um, this is going to be available on our podcast within the next couple of days, and I will load this to YouTube probably here in the next 20 minutes. So you can see, you can rewatch the video here on Facebook, or you can access us, access our Dyslexia Coffee Talks anytime on our YouTube channel. And of course, on our podcast, which is streamable on your favorite podcast platform, whatever that may be. So thanks everybody for joining us. And Don, again, Thank you so much. This has been amazing. Yes, and thank you, Ashley. It was fun. Have, have a great day. Okay, you too.